Good day to everyone. I hope you enjoyed the first excerpt from Reg Barker's interview and got a feel for the kind of character that he was. Uh, this second excerpt covers the time from when Reg was in jail in Hamburg through to Dulag Luft, the transit and interrogation centre. Some experiences of when he was a prisoner of war and then finally through to liberation. Don't forget that Reggie's full story features in the book Last of the Kriegers, along with that and four other POWs available on the fightinghigh.com website. Please like and share the video, subscribe to the Steve Darlow Fighting High YouTube channel to receive notifications of when we post other videos of interviews with other veterans. Now, once more, over to you Reg. Yes, my train to Frankfurt with a German, I uh, can't remember, about four of us, I think, in the compartment with a German. And uh, he said, well, Hitler, he's good. Mm. Um, when we arrived in Hamburg, we went into solitary confinement for five days. When, sorry, you, you said Hamburg, do you mean when you arrived at Frankfurt? That was, yes, from Hamburg to Frankfurt, to Frankfurt. that's right. Frankfurt. There was a, an establishment called Duleg Luft, which I think means something like um, Air Force um, in transit. Duleg, I think, meant that it's not a, a stalag, a stationary camp, but a, um, a place that people pass through anyway. I went through in five days and had various interrogations. I never, had, I, I never needed to give more than my name, rank and number. Uh, one was pressed with various types of approach. There was the, the friendly man who'd been to Cambridge, well educated, talked about the difficulties Germany faced after the First World War, it was supposed to arouse sympathy and then hoped that he could get some information, but it didn't work, obviously. In my case, I was just naive as far as I was concerned. Name, rank and number is all I was able to give. And, uh, and then were the bully boys, but they didn't actually, uh, they were aggressive, but they didn't, they didn't harm me in any way. Um, but, you know, they made, they made me realise how tough they could be if they, if they wanted to, if I didn't cooperate, which I didn't, of course. And then there was the bogus Red Cross form, which you might have heard of, where um, you'd uh, be presented with a form with a Red Cross on the top and Red Cross Geneva, it all looked very official. And uh, there were lots of questions. It started off, well, of course, with name, rank and number, and then parents' names and religions and place of birth, etc. And they got more detailed. They wanted to know, of course, about the squadron that you flew on and the operations you were on and the aircraft you were flying, etc., etc. Well, of course, the danger there was if you just filled name, rank and number and left the rest blank, they might fill in the rest and take it to your members of your crew and say, look, your skipper's filled it in. So what I did was to put lines through all the questions that I didn't want to answer. And then, of course, they ranted and raved about that. Didn't like that, did they? However, it's all like some sort of a game, isn't it, when you're only 22? <laughs> and I was alive. And they were losing the war. And any day I'd be, I'd be home. Well, any week. Three weeks, I judged, but I was a bit out there. It took nine months. You'd had training for this to prepare for this I think we'd be, interrogation. I think brief. we must have had at some time a lecture briefing us on this kind of thing, that things to watch out for, you know. And then we were all assembled, and because I was the senior officer, well, I was a flight lieutenant anyway, I was the senior of the all the air crew who were assembled, about 50 of us, I think, were then on our way to the uh, train to be taken to various camps. So I was approached to stand out in front of the parade, nothing unusual about that, and they required me to instruct the, uh, my comrades that uh, we would give them an assurance that we would not make any attempt to escape on the journey to wherever we were going. So of course I did my or Flynn bit at that point and turned and faced them all and said, when you hear what they say, chaps, they want us to promise that we won't try to escape, but we all know 
if we had the opportunity, to escape is what we want to do and it's our duty anyway. So of course I turned back to them and they weren't very happy about this. They then decided we'd all have our boots removed when we got on the train, so we all take tag our boots off. And uh, we travelled then on the transport um, to the main station and then on a seven day cook's tour of Germany. We went all the way across from Frankfurt on Main that was, right the way across Germany to Frankfurt on Oder. And then we turned north all the way up to Stettin. Then we turned west and ended up at Bart, B-A-R-T-H, on the Baltic Sea, Staligluf 1. And there I was for nine months, until the day when we were liberated by the Russians. We thought they were great chaps and when suddenly there was a murmur on May the 1st, 1945, we suddenly had a sense there was some excitement and it almost seemed as if the ground was rumbling and trembling and it was because hundreds of POWs, thousands perhaps altogether, were racing across the sandy compound towards the fence and the gates where the Russians had arrived to meet the Russians. It was so exciting. Quite extraordinary. However, we received orders from our senior officers that we must not leave the camp. They were concerned about us going off and getting beaten up maybe or shot by marauding German soldiers. And so we were instructions to stay in the camp. But uh, they relented after a day or two. I rather think a Russian drew a pistol <laughs> on one of the senior officers and opened the gates and left them open. So we wandered down into the local town. It was rather boring because there were no people around. There were white flags hanging out of the windows. People in that local locality must have been just terrified of the Russians because I think they were pretty brutal. Anyway, we waited patiently for the, the um, to be take, brought back to England, but in the meantime, the Russians issued us with four Red Cross parcels and between the, sept the August when I'd been captured and the Christmas, we received one Red Cross per man per week. Otherwise, the German ration was one loaf of bread, one loaf of black bread per week per man, and a bowl of potato soup each day. But from Christmas 1944 until May 45, when we were liberated, we were reduced to the bare German rations of one, black, one loaf of black bread per week, per man, and a bowl of potato soup. Now we did in fact supplement our rations, because we discovered that the, the, after the uh, potatoes had been peeled, that all the peelings went down a chute into a bin, where they were collected by a local farmer to feed his pigs. Well, we thought we were more worthy than <laughs> German pigs. So we used to scuttle along underneath the windows, out of sight, and fill a bowl with these potato peelings and take them back and boil them up. And uh, there was a lot of goodness, I'm told, in the, in the skins of potatoes. And in fact, in posh restaurants now, they serve them. I don't ever go for them. What do they call them? Potato skins or something? I think it's called skins, yeah. Something. Yes. <laughs> That's all. Anyway, they, they, they broke open the Red Cross store and gave us each... A red, four Red Cross parcels, four Red Cross parcels, <coughs> which would be the equivalent of a month's rations during the days before Christmas when we used to receive them. But not having received any parcels from Christmas on to May, May the 1st when they arrived, um, every day from then on seemed like Christmas. It was very exciting and I remember making toffee with the powdered milk and the, uh, and the sugar and so on. But in due course we were marched away from our camp. I should tell you, when the Germans left the day before the Russians arrived, um, they'd handed over the gun, the gun positions to our own chaps, because the, our senior officers knew which of us had handled rifles, perhaps been in the... Um, might even been in the army, some of them, undoubtedly. Probably came out at Dunkirk and decided to join the RAF instead. <laughs> um, so it was quite a surprise to find our own chaps up manning the guns, the gun towers. Anyway, in due course we were take, marched away and we 
was taken to an airfield and flown back. In this case, um, I was flown back in a flying fortress, an American B-17. So I had the distinction of flying there in a Lancaster and flying home in a, an American B-17. I always wondered afterwards whether the pilot might have been one of my one of my cadets from my days as an instructor. Anyway, we were packed tightly into this aeroplane and very pleased to arrive back home in England. Lovely green grass and the middle-aged ladies of the Women's Voluntary Service, which is now called the, Women, the Women's Royal Voluntary Service, isn't it? The WRBS to greet us with cups of tea and sandwiches. And we're back in, back in Blighty. End of story.